Okay, this is a uh, micro two lecture, and uh, so I think this is uh, the third week. Let's see. Let me just double check that. Yeah. So uh, let's see. So it's if we look at the if we look at the um, syllabus. So. Here we are on the ninth. Yeah, so it's the third video. We did a we did a Zoom, and then a video, a video, and this is the third video. And uh, there will be a post video quiz to do uh, today. Um, the uh, what I'm going to cover today, I'll go through that in just a second. Um, I I will do. I think this Friday. I think what we're going to or this Thursday. I think what we'll do is. Uh, uh, the, the a, a demonstration lab. I don't know if we're going to do the the DAC ADC demo lab. We may we may do. I may just do a an ADC demo lab. And since you don't really have a nice, um, let's see if I can make that work again. Since you don't really have a good um, uh, way to generate an input. Uh, if you just have at least one wire, what you can do is you can put in uh, ground and you can put in VCC, uh, which would be 3.3 volts. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Uh, and that'll at least verify that the lab's working, uh, that the ADC is working. And then we'll talk about how to change it and how to set it up so that we have two channels. And then eventually we'll, we'll use that software uh, as part of our tilt table software at least that's my plan, unless we're able to port over the program that we were using from uh, previous years, uh, in which case maybe we'll use that. But anyway, at least this will give you a little bit of familiarity with the, the ADC. And I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a lab video uh, and have it available hopefully Thursday. And in that video, I'll kind of demonstrate that. But I, So I won't go over that in the lecture today. Um, all right. But what we will cover in the lecture today, we'll take a quick look at the, at the ARM assembly language. We'll take a little bit of an overview of C, and then we'll also look at uh, the clock uh, module a little bit, and maybe we'll take a quick peek at the ADC module if, if we have time for that. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm going to uh, bring up the slides, uh, I think, and then I'm gonna shrink me down and put me over put me over here. Right. Hang on, it's going to take a minute to get this done. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so first thing I want to do is this. And then I want to do uh, this and this. Perfect, I think. Yeah. All right, that looks good. All right, so uh, hopefully this will work. Um, I think you'll be able to see me here, and you'll be able to look at the slides here. Okay, good. All right, so uh, so what I want you to learn, I want you to get a basic feel for the instruction set for the M0 plus core, the, the, the assembly language instruction set, obviously, and we'll talk about that. I want you to be familiar with the basic functions of the multipurpose clock generator, uh, including that it has a frequency lock loop and a phase lock loop. We'll talk about that briefly. I probably won't get into that as much as I'd like to. I'd really love to talk about those because those are really important things for you to understand, but we'll, we may come back to those later in the course if we have time. And then I'm going to go through a, a, a review of C, and uh, this will probably take the bulk of the lecture. And uh, I, I do this because I know a lot of you uh, are still sort of uh, developing your abilities in C. If you uh, are all over this, then that's fine. You, uh, this may not be helpful for you, but I think most of you will probably find it helpful. And then, um, and then, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about the ADC module, but I'll probably cover that more in the uh, lab video that I'll do for Thursday. Okay, so away we go. So first off, uh, just a quick review. We've, we've been over this before, so I'm not going to spend much time. Here are the main features of our core. It has a nested vectored interrupt controller. Now, by nested, we mean that you, can, uh, that you have different la layers of priority and that high priority interrupts can interrupt lower priority interrupts. So you can nest your interrupts. Uh, secondly, vectored means that we have a table. 
and in that table we have an, we have uh, names for all the various uh, potential interrupts and they're called weak aliases and the weak aliases have just a short bit of code that basically returns from interrupt and doesn't do anything uh, or it sends it to a standard address where there's just a return from interrupt you know to instruction interrupt service routine and remember we call interrupt service routines ISRs okay but uh, but the way these weak alias names work is all you have to do is use the same name and create your own function and it will automatically the assemb the compiler will automatically uh, replace the weak alias with your new alias or with your new with your identical name and let that be the primary name so that uh, the weak alias is ignored and then what happens is when an interrupt occurs it will go to this table and get the vector to the to the exact interrupt that's a interrupt service routine that's designed to service that particular interrupt so you can have say 20 different sources of interrupts and you can have 20 different interrupt service routines and whenever an interrupt occurs with four levels of priority and whenever an interrupt occurs it will go to the vector table and it'll it'll be directed to the exact uh, start of the interrupt service routine for that particular interrupt assuming you wrote one and uh, hopefully you did because otherwise it's not going to work very well okay so so that's really a nice very powerful feature of this chip and it's a that's pretty much I, I don't know there may be some other features of interrupts that uh, that are available but that's really one of the best ones the only other thing I guess that that you could do that is not being done in this case is you could ha you could have a, uh, a designated stack pointer for uh, the interrupt itself uh, but I think in, on this core they didn't interrupt the two levels of stack pointer they inter the only interrupt the only implemented one and so you still got the same stack pointer when you go into your ISR but the all the critical registers all the general purpose registers the status register the uh, the program counter all that stuff is pushed onto the stack so when you return all that stuff is popped off the stack uh, and if you need local variables uh, they're generally created uh, using the stack and we call that whole uh, that whole picture then in the stack the stack frame which is uh, what's used by that by a function call if that's what it if that's what it is or by an interrupt service routine in this particular case which because we're talking about interrupts all right you can also use interrupts to do the wake up of the chip and uh, and then in addition to all this we have uh, a a memory protection unit that allows you to to uh, to, to designate portions of memory for various uh, applications we don't really we're not spending a lot of time using that in this in this chip because this chip uh, did not implement uh, the two levels of stack and basically everything runs then at the same at the same at supervisory level essentially and then there's a, a advanced high-speed bus light interface uh, which allows for uh, direct memory access uh, channels it allows for a whole bunch of other stuff and then and then they have the, this low latency uh, IO interface to the GPIO pins which uh, is so poorly documented it's hard to figure out how to use it <laughs> to be perfectly honest but in any event uh, so there's very powerful features and then to top it all off there's a, there's a lot of built-in uh, uh, debug capability including uh, the ability to uh, to have all sorts of software and hardware breakpoints to have uh, all sorts of data watch windows and whatnot uh, to even have a micro trace buffer and all this runs through a built-in uh, debug access port that is always always available and can be uh, can be accessed anytime. And uh, with the proper interface to the chip, you can actually watch uh, variables change in real time. Although I think that uh, there may be a little speed penalty for that. I'm not really sure. But in any event, uh, I haven't ever gotten that feature to work successfully. Uh, it's a little bit squirrely, but but basically, it's a very powerful uh, debug interface all right so uh, I'm not going to go through this we've seen a lot of this before but uh, all, all the it does have this fancy access to the GPIO ports again which I say is poorly documented and hard to use it does have a two-stage pipeline does have uh, mostly uh, mostly uh, 
all 16-bit instructions. Uh, and this is this gives it pretty good code density. Uh, there are six 32-bit instructions, but uh, the code basically is fairly compact, which is nice. And then um, and it does have the ability to optimize access to program memory. All right. Uh, so the so the the M0 plus core is 100% compatible with the, the original ARM M0. I don't know if that's really you know important anymore because the M0 plus has been out for so long now. Uh, and the uh, the machine language uh, instruction set is a subset of the standard ARM Cortex language that's used with the M3, the M4, the M6, and others. And there are a whole bunch of existing third-party uh, compilers, uh, debug tools, a whole ecosystem around this ARM, uh, the Cortex-M uh, world. 56 instructions, six that are 30, uh, six that are 32-bit, and the other 50 are 16-bit instructions. There are 17 registers, 13 uh, general purpose I.O. registers, and um, and then um, four others. Uh, there's this linear four gigabyte address space, and everything's in that. Uh, so there is not a separate program memory uh, and uh, data memory uh, worlds. They both exist in the same address space. They both have the same data bus, and the address space, the address bus, and data bus are both 32 bits. But every location in this four gigabyte address space references an eight bit location. But you do have the ability, uh, you do have instructions that can move eight bits or one byte. You, can have, you have instructions that can move two bytes together called a half word and four bytes together, which is called uh, a word. So you can have word, half word, and byte uh, instructions. And, um, and those are all built into the assembly language uh, uh, instruction set. Okay. Um, all right. I think I talked about this mostly already. And uh, we do have six kilobytes of static RAM. I think that's correct. I am so confused. I, I have seen so many different numbers. I'm always uh, eternally confused about this. Let me just maybe check real quick. Okay. So you can see here uh, we have. Um, the, uh, the the chip that's on the Freedom Board, the Freedom Board we have is the MLK25, uh, M yeah, the KL25Z128VLK4. Uh, this is the part number, the M, but we generally don't talk about the M for some reason. Anyway, uh, and it is a 40 megahertz chip, 80 pins, low profile quad flat pack with a total flash memory for program of 128 kilobytes and a static RAM of 16 kilobytes. Okay, so it actually has 16. I think I've been screwed up on that for a long, long, long time for some strange reason. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so 120 kilobytes of flash, 16 kilobytes of static RAM. All right, and then we have, we have these things. We've talked mostly about this other stuff. Our clock generation module does have a frequency locked and a phase locked loop for system and CPU clock generation. And you have some internal references, a 4 megahertz and a 32 kilohertz internal reference clocks. It can also use uh, external oscillators. Well, it's also got a built-in low power 1 kilohertz oscillator for the real-time clock and the, and the watchdog timer. Uh, but it also supports an external crystal clock. On the Freedom Board, there's an 8 megahertz external crystal that uh, that is used as the clock. So we do have, uh, and then that external, that eight megahertz clock can be divided up uh, all the way to as, as fast as 48 megahertz, or it can be or pretty much almost uh, a pretty wide range of clock frequencies uh, from 48 megahertz on down. And that's, that's done by the frequency lock loop or the phase lock loop. All right, and we've looked at most of this stuff. I'm not gonna go all this again. Um, and uh, so we've got a lot of timer modules uh, for general purpose timers. We've got, uh, they support PWM and all sorts of other good stuff. Uh, there's a periodic interrupt timer, uh, which makes it real convenient for a real-time operating system. Uh, 
that you can use to switch between tasks so that it appears that all the tasks are running at the same time. And um, it can also be used to trigger ADC conversions and other things. All right, um, and then we have um, lots, of, uh, lots of GPIO ports. We talked about that. It can operate from 1.71 volts to 3.6 volts. Ours runs at 3.3 volts. There is an on-chip uh, a voltage regulator to get that. All right, and um, so, all right. And just to review the programmer's model again, we have 13 general purpose registers, R0 through R12. The upper five are generally for just uh, a few instructions, uh, but the lower uh, eight, R0 through R7, are available to any instruction that uses registers. Uh, and I, they mostly all do, but not all of them. Uh, and then there's a, there are not two stack pointers though, only one was implemented uh, by Freescale in, the, in their version of this chip with the, this core, the M0 Plus. They could have implemented two, they didn't, and that's fine. And then there's also what's called a link register, which is uh, involved in subroutine and function calls. Uh, and uh, then the program counter, and then the status register, which has uh, a few bits in it, including the status bits. And then, and that's pretty much it. So uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and that's the 17 core registers. And uh, don't worry about the, the, the prime mask and the control register, they're not part of the core. All right, so again, uh, all the registers are 32 bits, uh, and we've talked about this. There are up to 32 external interrupt inputs. Um, again, each, each has four levels of priority. And there are some built-in interrupts, which we haven't really seen before. And these, these are sometimes called uh, traps or exceptions or um, system interrupts or things like that. And, uh, okay. And you can reload, relocate the vector table if you want. Um, all right, so, uh, and then there's this debug support. All right, and uh, again, there's a single 32-bit advanced high-speed uh, uh, bus uh, light system that provides all this system integration. And then we do have this uh, these single-cycle I.O. ports and um, whatnot. Okay, so, we, so the, the ARM processors, and that's not just the M0 Plus, but it's all of them, support the following data types, byte, half word, word, and double word. Uh, all the processor registers are 32 bits, and data does need to be what's called byte aligned. And what that means is that if you're referencing a single byte, then any address will be valid. If you're res referencing a uh, two bytes together are a half word, then you can only re you can only reference even addresses because odd addresses are illegal, and that's because the half words are lined up from beginning to end, and you have to treat them as such. And then if you're addressing a full word, then those also have to be byte aligned, and those those are on every four bytes, so that would be uh, that would be zero, four, uh, eight, and C addresses for the for the lower uh, hex digit and then double words would just be double that um, so okay let's see this okay so the thumb instruction set is a 16-bit instruction set except for the six 32-bit instructions and that's why they talk about this code density thing it's about equivalent programs about 65% the size of a standard ARM coded uh, program. Uh, the improved performance, uh, so the the instruction set was written with the idea that you, you didn't have unlimited memory and it is a subset of the ARM instruction set and it's, uh, yeah, I think I, I think I saw this, it's a, did we do this? It's a, uh, yeah, I don't think we've actually. No, okay. Well, the the official name is 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 um, ARM three VM something or other. Anyway, 
but it's just called thumb and so that's a that's probably the best name for it um, <clears throat> it's not a regular instruction set uh, it's it which means it's it's missing some instructions you would normally have uh, and and then there are constraints for some instructions that aren't evenly applied across all the various instructions and the reason for that is it's targeted at compiler generation not hand coding so the whole idea is that that you would write these programs in C and they would be compiled and that you wouldn't write them in assembler it, you can think of assembler as hand coding yes the assembler does do some work for you and let you use mnemonics and whatnot but you're still writing every single machine instruction you're writing it out in assembler all right so these are the various data types that are held in register so 32-bit pointers so pointers are all 32 bits and the uh, you can also have integers the, on this machine or this chip integers are 32 bits and they can be unsigned or signed obviously and then you can also have unsigned or signed um, 16-bit and 8-bit integers the unsigned are zero extended and the signed are sign extended now let me explain what that means every register you have on this machine is a 32-bit register when you put a byte in that register that only fills up one of the four byte positions in the register so what about the other positions or if you put it in a half word you've only filled up 16 bits of the 32 bits what happens to the other bits well if you write in an unsigned uh, integer where you've defined it as an unsigned it, when you uh, created it then the bits you don't write will be zero extended and so if you write eight bits then you then you're gonna have 24 bits that'll be zeros if you if you're using if you if the variable you're working with was designated as a signed integer then uh, the those other if you write an 8-bit integer to that register the other 24 bits will be the same as the most significant bit so if the most significant bits are one then the other 24 bits will all be one we call that sign extended form because even though in two's complement that high order bit is not really a sign bit uh, but it functions as a sign bit and uh, and so we just sign extend that bit and then <clears throat> then the 64-bit integers uh, which we're probably never going to work with you are held in two separate registers all right load so the, the primary one of the main instructions are load instructions and store instructions so uh, load instructions take stuff from memory and put it into registers and store instructions take stuff from registers and put it in memory uh, you can transfer a single byte a half word 16 bits or 32 bits a word from to and from memory and you always have to be thinking about uh, if you're doing dealing in, in something smaller than a 32-bit number then you have to think in terms of zero extended or sign extended depending on whether it was uh, uh, whether it was signed or unsigned um, <clears throat> there are some load and store operators that can transfer two or more words to and from memory and these instructions allow you to actually load and store these 64-bit integers uh, but there's no other direct support for 64-bit integers in uh, and and this is the name the official name is arm v6 dash m arm v6 dash m that's the instruction set but everybody calls it thumb so um, unsigned and signed formats so obviously if you have an unsigned integer in a in a uh, and say it's a full word so that's 32 bits so it can be 0 to 4 gigabytes or for it can be uh, 0 to 4 I guess that's 4 billion uh, if you if you uh, have if it's signed then then you can only then uh, or 32 billion now if it's so if it's unsigned you can go from 0 to 32 billion if it's signed you can go from roughly minus uh, minus 
31 billion to plus 31 billion. But the, you, can, you always get one more number negative than you get positive. But when you're dealing with uh, 32 billion, that's kind of insignificant. But when you're dealing with a byte, it's a little more significant. If you're just dealing with a byte, then, uh, then a signed byte can go from minus eight to plus seven. Okay, so you can do some integer arithmetic. It has built-in bitwise logical operations. So you can bitwise and, bitwise or, you can exclusive or, you can bitwise complement. You can shift bits. You can do additions and subtractions and multiplications. There is no, uh, there's no hard, there's no assembly language instruction for division with the exception of shifting to the right, which is dividing by powers of two. But if you want to do a real division, then you have to write your own routine. Uh, in, the, in the manual, they describe these operations using pseudocode, which is basically kind of a whole nother language that's just used to describe these assembly language instructions. But it's not really it's not a language in, in and of itself. It's just uh, it's just for description. Okay, so the shift and rotate operations include logical shift left, uh, and zeros are shifted in at the right end. Um, logical shift right, zeros are shifted in at the high end. Or arithmetic shift right. When you shift arithmetically right, you uh, you shift you copy. The, the high order bit. So basically you're preserving the sign. Because if you shift it in zeros and you shifted it uh, one bit to the right and it were and it and it were in two's complement form, a sign number, and it and it were and it happened to be negative, when you shifted it right one bit, if you shift it in a zero, now you've changed the number completely and you've made it a positive number. Uh, so that's uh, that would really screw things up. So the arithmetic shift right, of course the arithmetic shift right has to know that that was defined as a signed number. And then you can rotate right, uh, which basically uh, shifts the bit off the right end and reintroduces it in the left end, and rotate left does the same thing. But I don't even know if there is a rotate left. Yeah, I don't think there is. I think there's just a rotate right. And again, that's kind of a, well, it's interesting. That's one of the it's one of the examples that's used to point out that well, it's not a complete instruction set. It's it apparently compilers use rotate right, but they don't use rotate left very much. All right, and then we here here is the uh, status register, and here are the status bits. There are bits 31, 30, 29, and 28. Uh, there are only a few other bits in this whole register that are used. One bit is. Uh, it is set to indicate that you're in using the thumb instruction set and if you change it in theory if you were in an M6 or an M4 or an M3 it would switch your instruction set to to the uh, the generalized uh, arm uh, instruction set but in this chip that instruction set doesn't work and so you have to use thumb or nothing so if you change that bit yeah you'll you'll basically have to reset the processor and start over uh, <clears throat> But your program will crash at that point. And the n bit is the negative bit. The z bit stand is is set if there's an operation that results in a zero in zeros. Uh, the <clears throat> carry bit is if you uh, overflow, and the v bit is if you have two's complement overflow. <clears throat> and remember, the two's complement overflow is defined as if you add a positive and a negative, or a negative and a positive, you can never overflow. But if you add two positives then the result should be positive. And if it's negative, you overflowed. If you have two negatives, the result should be negative. And if you don't, if it turns out it's positive, you overflowed. All right. <clears throat> so the address space, the four gigabyte address space is memory mapped. That means everything, all the input output, all the function, special function registers, all the GPIO pins, everything has an address in this, in this uh, four gigabyte address space. In fact, uh, some of the stuff has has a couple different addresses uh, in the same uh, four gigabyte address space for various reasons. 
Also within that same four gigabyte address space is you have all your, your uh, uh, static random access memory and you also have all of your uh, uh, all of your flash memory where your program memory would be. So it's all in the same four gigabyte address space. And, and it is in little endian format. Little endian format refers to the fact that when you, when you, uh, when you hook up bytes, I think I have it defined here, uh, the most, so let's say this is location zero, location one, location two, location three. If you put a 32-bit word in here, the low order byte will be here, the next byte will be here, the next byte will be there, and the next byte there. That's, that's little endian. If you, if you have a half word, then the low order byte will be the, lo, the first byte in memory, and the higher order byte will be the second byte. Now, this to me makes total sense, and that's, that, that is why the vast majority of most uh, machines run in little endian format. But amazingly enough, uh, you, can, you can have big endian format where you flip it around and the higher order byte is first, next, next, and the lower order byte is the, the, it would be byte number three. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but, but there are some machines that are set up that way. In this particular example, uh, this M0 plus core can be set up either way, but you have to make that choice when you uh, implement the, uh, uh, the Verilog file and you build your, you, you actually make your integrated circuit. So once you've made your chip, you've already made this decision, and your chip is either in little endian byte format or big endian byte format. And uh, this, the, KL, uh, the, the uh, KL25Z is in little endian byte format. All right. <clears throat> and then uh, when you have instruction ordering, uh, it's set up like this. So, yeah, and the and the half word one is at the lower address. Now here they've placed it first, which is a little confusing based on the other diagram. So don't worry about this. It's, here's the whole address space. Uh, there, it's divided up into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight chunks of about 500 megabytes each. And this is generally what's going on there. There's really no reason for you to know this, uh, but typically the static the static uh, RAM starts at at hex 2 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 I think I got enough zeros. Uh, the, uh, the, the flash memory typically starts at, at 0 to to just below the static memory. And then <clears throat> some of the peripherals are mapped in these other spaces and then the system stuff happens in this upper uh, upper address space. All right. <clears throat> so the instruction set again, 50 16-bit instructions and most of those can only access the eight of the general purpose registers and they're known as the low registers. A small number of 16-bit instructions can also access the high registers as well as the 32-bit, I think most of the 32-bit instructions can ex access them as well. And um, your conditional execution is based on the, uh, the flags in the status register and you can only, you can only <clears throat> Your, your branch range is minus 256 to plus 254 bytes. So <clears throat> this, does, this does limit um, how far these branches can branch and, and so that can be a bit of a problem. Uh, and obviously the C compiler has to keep that in mind. And your Ys, if you set up functions and you're gonna call uh, one function from another function, it's smart to, to try and prevent those from being more more than 256 bytes away. But C will take care of it for you. All right, so what are our instruction types besides the loads and stores? So branch instructions, data processing, we talked about some of these already, 
status register access instructions, load and store, and then load multiple and store multiple. This is where you can actually load or store multiple bytes or multiple multiple words, multiple 32-bit words, right? and even multiple 64-bit uh, words, I think. Well, I don't know about that, but for sure, multiple 32-bit words. And, um, and then there's some miscellaneous stuff, like no ops and other things. Uh, I don't think we'll go through all this. I just want to basically, uh, there's a there's branch to target address, uh, branch to a subroutine, essentially. Uh, and here's the range you can do this. Uh, branch based on a register and branch based on a target address. Here's some of the standard data processing, add with carry, add, um, by, bitwise and, bitwise, bit clear, compare negative, compare, uh, bitwise exclusive or, uh, bitwise not, bitwise or, uh, reverse subtract, uh, subtract with carry, subtract, and, uh, and then test. And then you have the arithmetic shift right, um, yeah, immediate register, arithmetic shift left, immediate register, logical shift right, immediate register, and rotate right register. Again, not not you don't get a full set of 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 uh, instructions because again it's not meant for hand coding and apparently the compiler doesn't use arithmetic shift left. It's really the same as logical shift left anyway. Uh, and then uh, rotate right. There's no rotate left. Uh, then these are how you how they pack and unpack. They can uh, sign extend byte a half word, unsign extend byte, unsigned extend half word, and that's where they can pack and unpack instructions. Um, and that's because remember all the registers are 32 bits. If you're dealing with byte, then sometimes you can you can use uh, you can have multiple bytes in the same instruction. But then you might you might have to unpack them and pack them as you put them in and out. Um, <clears throat> and you can have these things. You can have the you can have the bytes lined up one way or the other way. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. This this is just. Uh, the status register access stuff. This is this allows you to change the status register, I guess. Um, all right, and then load and store. Remember, you can load 32-bit, 16-bit, uh, signed and unsigned, 8-bit, signed and unsigned. And these are the uh, these are where you can have load multiple. And you, you have to set up set registers. You can also pop multiple registers off the stack. You can push multiple registers onto the stack, and then you can uh, store multiple. And you, you can you, you use a register. You increment, uh, so you can count how many you're going to do. All right. Um, and some of these things I don't even know. Uh, the, the data memory barrier and data synchronization barrier and instruction. Synchronization barrier. These things are set up so you can. Uh, that's part of the memory protection, uh, which would really be if you're if you're running this with a with a real time operating system. Um, and some of these other things are system events. Um, send event basically triggers an interrupt. It's a software interrupt. A supervisor call same thing that terminates that jumps out of an application to the supervisor. But again, that assumes you you have. A supervisory and application mode set up, which our ch this chip doesn't. So anyway, um, and then here's the conditional branching, and that's one really nice feature of this chip. It does have it does use the four condition flags, and it supports uh, it supports uh, both unsigned and signed compares. So it can handle two's complement stuff or unsigned stuff, uh, and those are those. Those are different because if you compare two by two, uh, say 32-bit words, uh, and one's signed and uh, one's unsigned, uh, then you, that makes the comparison goofy. You so you you have to know whether the words were signed or unsigned, and you have to compare like to like. Uh, and if you don't, you have to modify them so you can. 
And, uh, but this gives you all these instructions to do it uh, if you're set up for that. Uh, all right, I think we're gonna talk about the clock a little bit. Uh, so let me just, all right. Okay, so the clock module uh, has both this phase lock loop and, and uh, the uh, and the frequency lock loop, and uh, the phase lock loop can only be used with an external reference clock. So, so in our case, we do have an external crystal, and so we can actually use either one. Um, the phase lock loop, uh, sorry, the frequency lock loop can be used with either the internal reference fast or slow clock and the external clock. Um, you have the two built-in internal clocks, the four megahertz and the 32 kilohertz. And they do have factory trim and user adjustable trim bits. So you can, you can tweak them. Uh, now, why would you wanna do that? Well, it turns out as these chips age, uh, the clocks do change slightly, and that's why you might wanna go back and trim them. The factory trims, because when the chips are manufactured, they're all just a hair different. And so in the factory, they uh, fire it up, run the, run the clocks, see what they're actually running at, and then they adjust the trim a little bit so that, uh, and have a factory trim setting so that they are, uh, so that they will be uh, uh, as close as they can be to uh, four megahertz and 32 kilohertz exactly. But they're not perfect, and an external crystal is always just a hair more accurate. But they're pretty good, uh, they're pretty good. And then you have this low power one kilohertz real-time clock oscillator, uh, which really is for the real-time clock and uh, for the uh, watchdog timer. And then uh, the, all these clocks then can be, well, the, the outputs from the phase lock loop and the, and the frequency lock loop are, can be used as clock sources for a bunch of the on-chip peripheral modules, like timers, PWM, A to D, and some others. Okay, so the phase lock loop is a voltage controlled oscillator and the, uh, the external reference clock is used as its source. And then there's this modulo uh, voltage controlled oscillator frequency divider. So you basically then divide this and then there's a frequency detector and then there's this uh, loop filtered so that basically you can, you can divide the clock or you can multiply the clock. And so you can make it faster or slower, which is kind of cool. And, the, and because it's phase locked, then uh, those divisions and multi, the division multiplication works out that, it, that it, they, they stay synced uh, very accurately. So, uh, so how when you have a reference clock at four megahertz, can you generate clocks at much faster or slower frequencies with a phase lock loop? Well, it's because of this, this feedback divider. And you can, you can, uh, you can, you can, uh, you can basically divide uh, fractionally so that you can actually uh, multiply it. All right. Um, so the frequency lock loop is set up with this digitally controlled oscillator, and you can. You can, there's four different frequency ranges you can use. Um, and uh, when you switch clocks, you can prevent the frequency lock loop from, uh, from resetting its current locked frequency um, if you didn't intend to change it. So you can basically keep it locked in even, uh, even when you're switching clock modes, which is nice, as long as you kept the frequency the same. And here's 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 uh, what this looks like. It, this this is uh, there's there's a couple of um, so it's a pretty complicated module for starters. This would be your external crystal oscillator, and we do have that on our chip, and uh, it's eight megahertz, and then it can come in and it can go through the uh, uh, either the uh, the, the frequency lock loop or the phase lock loop here. And uh, then those clocks then can be routed a bunch of different ways through these multiplexers. You have the, uh, the master clock generator out clock, and then there's a whole bunch of other clocks that can all be used for uh, different peripherals. 
So, all right. Um, yeah, and I think this is homework, uh, one of the homeworks. Describe how a phase lock loop can generate faster and slower clocks than the reference. And I, I think that's in the homework list already. All right. Um, okay, I think now I'm going to, I'm going to, Switch. I didn't. I uh, give me one second here. Okay, so we're about forty-five minutes. I'm probably going to go uh, a good, uh, probably thirty more minutes, and we're going to go through the C review. I'm going to try and go through this fairly quickly. I know most of you are familiar with C, uh, but I what I don't know, uh, what I also know is that a lot of you uh, uh, are still a little bit uh, weak in programming, and so hopefully this will just kind of uh, help you kind of remember at least what you've already learned. All right, so there's a, so pretty much at this point, I think you can say for most embedded design purposes, C has replaced uh, assembly language firmware. Uh, there's probably not, very, not much assembly language firmware being written these days, maybe a little bit, uh, there still are some really small, chi smaller chips with little bitty memories that uh, that still would use uh, a lot of assembly language. But most of the time, you're going to write your embedded application in C because most of the time, the processors you're using have a fair amount of flash memory associated with them. Uh, the KL25Z uh, VOK128 has, uh, or 128VOK4 has. Um, 128k of program memory. That's a lot, uh, and you can have a pretty big program. Uh, so, and it has, and we also have 16 uh, kilobytes of flash. So that's that's a lot of flash, a lot of memory. So that's really good, and and uh, so you can definitely afford to uh, use a higher level language where there's obviously it's not going to be quite as efficient as a carefully hand coded assembly language routine, but it, but it's still going to be fine. Um, there are some good books out there, kind of Kurt and Richie. I think, uh, I think Richie. Uh, the, well, one of the maybe both these guys developed the C language, uh, and they they may still be around and on the uh, and on the um, on the C committee. Uh, they they still are they still are quoted as the experts uh, for the adjudication of. Uh, you know, of, of like answering questions about why this and why that wasn't included in C. Um, so there's some interesting things. Um, so basically, uh, so the C program, it's, it's largely based on functions uh, and then uh, well-typed variables, but also, of course, there are a lot of operators. Uh, but you start off with a main function and then it calls other functions, and pretty much every every logical block in the program is a function. Um, and all the functions uh, functions contain statements that specify what operations are going to be performed. And you have declarations, assignments, uh, function calls, control statements, and nulls. Um, and uh, basically, the variables just store values to be used in various computations. And um, the main functions required in every in every program. All right, you don't have to have the file doesn't have to be named main, but there has to be a main function within it. And that's where once the start uh, the start uh, setup software that's generated by the compiler and the assembler is all uh, is all finished, it transfers control to the main routine. That's how that works. Okay. Um, Variables are, are identified by letters and digits, and the underscore character can be used to improve, uh, improve readability of long variables. Uh, they're, they're data types in C, and it is a strongly typed language. It has five basic data types, void, which is nothing, char, int, float, and double. Now, uh, the RS-232, the IEEE 754 standard for floats and doubles has changed. And now there are some additional uh, additional formats for those variables, uh, which I'm sure are are all going to show up. It's about two years old now, and I'm I'm sure you'll see those in compilers more and more as time goes on. 
So we, we will have different size floats. Integers are sort of by definition uh, machine dependent. Uh, in, in the PIC chip, they're, they're all 16 bits. In this chip, they're all 32 bits. Uh, so it really does depend on your compiler. And, and the compilers typically are targeted for particular chips. Uh, and then the chars are all 8 bits. It, it sort of stands for character, but they're by no means restricted to characters. Uh, they can definitely be used for numerical things as well. Um, okay, I think I said that. Um, there are a number of qualifiers that can be applied to some of these data types. Uh, things like uh, signed and unsigned for uh, chars and integers are the most obvious and important ones, but there are also things like static, um, external, uh, volatile, uh, there are there are a number. Uh, static refers to when uh, we have a function that uses uh, an internal variable and if you don't specify static then that variable will come into existence and go out of existence each time the function is called and then exited. If you make it static then the variable will be preserved so the next time you go into that function that variable will, will have the value it, that it was left with when the function ended the last time. And then volatile indicates to the compiler that, uh, that external forces may change the value uh, of that variable. So for instance, that's what happens if a variable represents a register and that register uh, could get changed by external inputs, then you, have, then you better declare it ver uh, volatile so that the compiler knows uh, not to assume if it doesn't see where you've changed it that, that there's no way it's going to change and then delete a bunch of code that you need. Uh, so you have to have to always remember about uh, volatile and static uh, and then external, global or some other considerations. Um, okay, now I think we covered this. Let's see. Uh, so yeah, so when you declare a variable, you specify its type and its name, and you can indicate an initial value. Uh, oh, you can also, there's also a constant. You can also declare things as constants too, and that also changes features about them. Uh, so you're not allowed to change the value of a constant, for instance. Um, so here's an example. We declared three integers, i, j, and k, two characters, cx and cy, uh, an integer m, and we declared its initial value as zero, and a character echo, and we declared its initial value, the ASCII character y. Generally, uh, generally, when we use this, no, this nomenclature, we're using ASCII values. Uh, I would expect that this will probably change down the road in, in, in some version of C eventually. Uh, and, and we're going to use, uh, uh, we'll probably go to, to uh, other, uh, other character sets besides ASCII. Um, but so far, this is still typical. Um, okay, if you want to, uh, this, this, this uh, single quote around this Y means it wants you to use the lowercase y and the actual value in char will be the, or in the, in the, the char echo will be the, uh, the, the ASCII value for lowercase y, which, um, which would be, let's see, lowercase y would be, um, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's decimal 121. So that's what it would be. But like I say, this may change over time. You can also do a, a string uh, by double quotes. And you have to remember that uh, that this has to be assigned. That this basically then is, a, is an array. And it's always one character more than the number of characters because there's a null character that that terminates it. And then finally, uh, you can have uh, 
a lot of times if, if the constant is longer than, uh, if, if it requires more than, than the standard integer size, then you have to append an, an L, lowercase or uppercase, to indicate long. And that usually increases the size that's set aside, but even there the standard is compiler dependent, chip dependent basically. You can specify, we can use a decimal, octal, or hex, or binary, uh, when we specify things. And um, we just have to add the prefix. Generally, we add no prefix for decimal. We have a zero for octal, and a zero x for hex, and a zero b for binary. Uh, and then you can use these arithmetic operators, uh, plus, minus, divide, multiply, and divide. Um, and if you use integers, then you don't get a fractional portion. You can do modulus, uh, but you can't do that with floats or doubles. And then you can uh, you can do this uh, increment by one or decrement by one. And if you put it before, it's a pre-increment. And so it means it'll increment the variable before you use it. If it's after the variable, it, it's going to it's going to increment it after you use it. And same with decrement. All right, bitwise operators. So there are six of them, and or exclusive or not, and then, uh, then right shift and left shift. Um, some languages are, well, in, yeah, anyway, this is good. I'm not gonna say any more about that. The ampersand is often used to clear bits the R is used to set bits, and the exclusive R is used to toggle bits, basically. However, on this, on the KL25Z, we have provided for us uh, pin, pin output set register, uh, or pin set output register, pin toggle output register, and pin clear output registers, where we always put a one in the proper place, and we don't have to invert masks and things like that. So, but if you if you use the actual uh, uh, output register, then you do uh, then you do have to uh, play around with the mass. Okay, let's see. Um, so the shift operator, shift right and shift left, is very very helpful for creating masks. And um, so if you have a variable x y z and you say x, y is equals x, y, z shifted right three places, then you basically divided by two, four, you've divided by eight. And uh, if you shift it right, then you're basically multiplying by eight. Uh, and the assignment operator uh, is the equal sign, and we can combine those with operators. We can combine it with the uh, bitwise and, the bitwise r, the shift right, shift left, exclusive r, and a whole bunch of them. We also have relational and logical operators. And the big difference between these are that they result in, uh, in, in logical outputs. So the result is always either going to be 1 or 0, which stands for true or false. And there's really, and it won't be anything else. Um, so you have to remember when you're dealing with logical operators that you just get logical results. And you can see, remember the double equal sign is the relational comparison when you want to see if two things are equal. And if you just use the equal sign, you're actually setting the one thing equal to the other thing, and then the result of that uh, will be uh, the result. Um, so uh, it's not a logical comparison. Um, then you have not equal greater than, greater than or equal, less than, less than or equal. And then you can do the logical and, the logical or, the logical uh, or the not. And the logical not, all those, uh, those look at the entire word. If anything in the variable, if you have say A logically and with B, uh, they both have to be non-zero for that to be true. And any value will work. So 13 logically and with 15 is true. And 13, or uh, you know, 5,000 logically ended with zero is false. Um, and the same with or. 
and then if you do the logical not, you convert whatever value you have. If it's non-zero, then it's converted to zero, and if it's zero, it's converted to one. I don't know, it says one's complement. That's really, I don't think that's, that's correct. That's goofy. So this is the way you would check to see if bit seven is zero. You bitwise and it with zero x eight zero, so that's an eight bit value with a high order bit set. And then if that results, uh, the only way that's gonna result in anything but zero uh, is if the uh, eight, if the higher order bit is set in this ATD zero stat zero. Uh, and then you invert that. And so then that's that's the logical inversion. So so if the if the bit is set, it will be false. If the bit is not set, it will be true. And then the statement will be executed. And same thing here. Here you comparing A1 to A2. Um, all statements are terminated by semicolons. Braces are, are group declarations um, into basically a compound statement or a block. And um, braces are one of the biggest uh, iterations of C. And that's one of the things that's been removed in Python, which is nice. Um, so uh, if else, uh, so you have uh, the if expression, and then if that's not true, then the else is evaluated and executed, or the else is executed. If the is, if the if is true, the else is not executed. And you can just leave that out. So if there's no else, then if the if statement is true, if the if expression is true, the statement will be executed. And if there's no else, if the expression is false, the statement won't be executed, and it, control will drop through the next instruction. You can also use this uh, question mark colon. And basically the way this works, it's and it's a very useful construct, and it's used a lot in Verilog, so it's a good one to learn. Uh, you have the test. In this case, is A uh, not equal to zero? And then if, it's, if A is not equal to zero, if the result of this test is true, then you do B, you act, then you assign B to R, and if it's false, you assign C to R. And you can nest these things as deep as you want. So, uh, so they, they can be quite interesting when you start nesting them. Um, we have a multi-conditional, an if, else if, else if, and finally an else. Remember, as this goes down, if anyone is, if anyone if the test for any one of these expressions is true, then that then then uh, then control will stop there and it'll jump to the next statement after the end of this uh, if else statement. So so if if say the first one's if the expression one is true, statement one will be executed and the other expressions two, three will never be even evaluated. All right. Um, the switch statement is is just a good way to do multiple ifs, and uh, and basically you have an expression, and it results in some number, and then you have case one, case two, case three, case four, case five. In in uh, the C language, you must break out of each of the cases, otherwise the the execution would drop through to the next case. Sometimes you may want that, and that's fine. But if you don't want that, you have to put a break for it to jump out to the end. And you can have a default case at the end that's labeled default colon, which it jumps to if none of these cases uh, uh, are, are realized, such as here, default. And, uh, and in later versions of C, then these, these don't have to be numbers, they can be, they can be uh, names and other things, like names of the months and days of the week and other things. Okay, um, but you do have to set that up. Uh, for loop, very powerful uh, construct. You have uh, three expressions, expression one, two, and three. 
uh, where expression one and three are assignments or function calls, and expression two is a relational operation. So this is this is a this is a test essentially. All right, the while statement and the do while. The while statement has an expression, which if evaluates as true, the statement will be executed and everything in the banks in the in the blank in the in the uh, within the bracket. Okay, so uh, there's one big distinction between the while statement and the do while statement, and this is really important to keep in mind. Basically, the do while statement just takes the, the test and moves it to the end. And what that does is, it means that regardless of whether the, uh, the expression in parentheses is evaluated for true or for false, and it always has to be evaluated one way or the other, the the statements in the brackets will always be executed at least one time when you use the do while format. And that's really important to know uh, because uh, if you want it to always be at least executed once, then the do while is a great uh, statement to use. If on the other hand you want it, you, you, you don't want it to execute at all if the expression is false, then you should just use the while. And this is a, we use this routinely when we're waiting for a bit to change um, uh, or we're waiting for a, uh, an operation to complete. Uh, it, it's very useful for this. So, so anyway, uh, and the example down at the bottom, notice here, uh, so you have, you know, some, some statement and then do, and then the statement here, print D, comma digit minus minus. So what that's going to do, it's going to post decrement digit and then the while test, as long as digit is greater than or equal to one, it'll keep printing. So if digit is 10, then this should print, I guess, uh, 10 times. I think that's right. Um, oh, I hear it's nine. So maybe it's nine times, but anyway. All right. Um, then we have this input and output. Now this is, it's important to understand that these input and output statements are not part of the C language. Uh, these are just uh, library functions. And as such, they bring with them uh, varying amounts of code. The, in, the, the get character, put character, and put string aren't so bad, but the printf brings in maybe a uh, maybe more than one k of instructions, so it's a it's pretty it's pretty bulky, and it has some it has some potential failure points that we often want to uh, uh, avoid in uh, you know in our embedded programs. So a lot of times we'll try not to use printf if we if we can get around it, but there are some really nice formatting uh, features in built into printf, and so that's why it gets used a lot, even though a lot of experts tell you not to use them. And here are the here are uh, some of the formatting things. Um, you probably know this, but uh, um, anyway, it's good to know a couple things. So, so the arguments of the printf can be written as constants, single variables, array names, or more complex expressions. And the formatting of the string is composed of individual groups of characters with one character group associated with each output item. And then the character group starts with percent. So these are called conversion characters. So it's percent and then the conversion character. And here's the list of conversion characters down here. C, D, E, F, G, I, O, S, U, X. And so you should be familiar with some of these. And if you're not, you should have this little chart handy so you can check them. Uh, and C is you just output a single character, D is a signed decimal, E is a floating point with an exponent uh, in essentially scientific notation, F is a floating point without using the scientific notation, G is uh, can use either F or E depending on whether it, uh, how many trailing zeros and, and how big it would be. Uh, so G is one way to get it formatted for you so that if it's a small number, it'll print out as digits, but if it's a big number, it'll print out more in scientific notation. And then I is an integer, sign decimal. O is printed in octal. 
s is a string, u is an unsigned decimal integer, and x is an hex. But it doesn't print out the 0x, it just prints out the hex values. And, uh, and there's all sorts of rules that apply here. Minus sign talks about less justified. Uh, you can put a number that specifies minimum field width, then a period, and then you can specify the field width uh, for precision. So the number, the precision, maximum number of characters to be printed from a string or number of digits after the decimal point, or the minimum number of digits for an integer. And then if H is an integer to be printed as a short or a long, uh, then you can put that in as well. Um, and I think that's pretty much, uh, this gives you an example. A lot of times you should always remember to put these backslash N or backslash L and backslash C. The backslash N gives you a new line, so that's a combination of a carriage return and a line feed. If you just want a line feed, backslash L. If you just want a carriage return and you want to overwrite the line you just wrote, like on a screen, then you can do backslash R. Uh, And if you want to use percent in your uh, in your text, then you can do you can precede it by uh, a backslash, and then you can type in one of these control characters. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. So functions and program structure. So remember, every C program has one or more functions, and uh, you can never define a function within another in function. Before you can use a function, you must have either provided the definition or a function prototype. And a lot of times we'll put function prototypes in header files and then we'll put the uh, functions in another C file so that, uh, so that you, can, you can include them uh, without totally cluttering up your main, your main file. But you do have to have function prototypes if you don't if you don't have a function. And the way you define a function, you specify what it returns, if anything. In this case, it returns a char. And here's the return for a char. And here's the return for a char. <coughs> and you put the statements again are grouped within these braces. And then you have the function name. And then you have all the function arguments that get passed. Remember, you can only return a single value from a function. You can return a pointer that points to an array, uh, but but you uh, or you can return an array name that contains an array, but you can't list a bunch of different variables out here. You can only list one. And remember that it's these are all functions are the variables are all passed by value, which means when you pass this char this cx, the cx in the main routine sends its actual value to the function, but in the main routine that cx is left unchanged, unless you pass a pointer and then you can change the actual original variable. So the function prototype. Again, because you can't call a function before it's been defined, you you resolve that by putting in function prototypes. And obviously, if you had a function A and a function B and they called each other, there would be no way to have both of them uh, defined before they were called, because one would have to precede the other. So that's why function prototypes are are, are essentially essential, and why it's it's good to use them because you generally want your main routine to be your first routine. Sometimes you you will allow an interrupt service routine to be a first routine. Now since this interrupt service routine is never called, it can always be first in, in a list and you never need a function prototype for an interrupt service routine. Uh, they never return a function, they never return a value and they can never have parameters passed to them. If they use parameters, they're going to have to come in the form of global variables. Or sometimes they'll be pushed on the stack. But that's a little bit risky because you, uh, well, no, scratch that thought entirely. 
Uh, the problem is you never know when that interrupt is going to occur, so you can't you can't really have anything set up ahead of time that you can guarantee will be ready and available. So that's a big problem. So we don't pass parameters to, to interrupt service routines, and they don't return parameters. We only can use global variables. All right. Uh, so header files. This is a good thing to do to uh, reuse functions that you've already created. You can collect a set of those and put them all into a header file, and or, or you put the prototypes in a header file, and then you use a C file where you put all your functions, uh, where their definitions are, and then you can just include these in your uh, in your project. Okay, uh, addresses. I'm just going to cover this somewhat briefly, but if you're fuzzy on address on pointers and addresses, you should go back and look at them. The first important piece of information here is to always remember that that whenever you're dealing with a variable there are at least two things involved thing or maybe three things one the type when you're dealing with C in some languages that's not an issue but in C the, the type is important then where in memory that vest that value that variable is stored and finally uh, the value of the variable and, and so you always have to keep those things in, in mind and you have to remember that the address where it's stored in memory has nothing to do necessarily with its value. Its value is an entirely different concept. Now they, I suppose at some point they could accidentally be the same number but that's not the point. The point is they're, they're conceptually totally different. The address is where it's stored and the value is the value that's stored at that address. Pointers are used to refer indirectly to variables. So we can store the address of a variable in a pointer and then that pointer will point to that variable. And so what we do is we, we take the address from the pointer, which is in itself a variable, and then we use that address to go get the actual value we're interested in. There are two operators that we use with pointers. The referencing uh, the dereferencing operator and the address operator. The star is the dereferencing operator and what that means is if AX is a pointer then star AX refers to the value that AX points to and not the actual value of AX. The ampersand takes the address of a variable so in this case, we have B equals ampersand C, then B must be a pointer, and it's going to be assigned the address of C, because the ampersand here is the, uh, is the address operator. Here, we have A equals 2, and then we have star B as a pointer, and then we have C equals 3. So here, star, so, so, so B without the star means you're dealing with the actual pointer value and that pointer value is going to be assigned the address of C. So now pointer B holds the address of variable C, not the value, but the address. And then if you want to assign the value of C to A, then you use the dereferencing operator star B, which means the value that B points to gets assigned to A, which in this case would be 3. All right. So um, this this operator ampersand uh, is how you take the address and assign it to a pointer. And then once it's assigned to the pointer, then then the dereferencing operator can refer not to the address but to the actual value at that address that the pointer points to. Okay, one other thing, and I, I think I'm going to quit with this, the uh, uh, arrays. Remember that uh, you can have multi-dimensional multi -dimensional arrays. The, a couple of things that are really important to keep in mind. First off is that arrays are defined, uh, if you define an array as say size 20, the valid values for that array are 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 19. The value 20 is illegal because when you assign it 
when you define it as x say 20 in in square braces that means you're you're reserving 20 locations for for the array elements of x and those elements are numbered 0 through 19 not 1 through 20 <coughs> two dimensions that work the same whenever you create an array within the actual C language itself that array is actually stored as a pointer and and because pointers have to be typed whenever you do pointer math the the compiler knows how many bytes each pointer is pointing to as its data type so pointers are are also typed so, so an integer pointer that points to integers cannot be used to point to floating points uh, numbers, our characters, our chars, for instance, because the pointer math would be wrong because if you want to move a pointer to the next char, you would add one because it's a single byte. If you want to move a pointer to the next integer, say it's a 32-bit integer, you would have to add you would have to add four because it's four bytes between each one. If you're working on a pig, you'd have to add two because it's 16 bits for an integer. And so the compiler knows all this stuff and it and when you do when you do pointer plus two, uh, then it'll point to the second element, the second type of data that it's pointing to. So if it's chars, it'll point two bytes away. If it's if it's doubles, it, it'll point a whole it'll point two times uh, what is it, eight bytes for a double. 2 times 8, so it'll point 16 bytes away. So the pointer math is all handled automatically by the compiler, and that's why it has to that's why things have to be typed. And that's why pointers also are defined as a type. Um, okay. And and even for double uh, for two-dimensional arrays, they're immediately turned into pointers, and the uh, the the first uh, range, or the first size, is the size between each element of the second range. I don't know if that makes sense, but but it's done row column, and basically uh, it it knows how to multiply things out to get to the to the right place. Okay. So any operations that can be achieved by an array subscripting can also be done with pointers. The pointer version will, in general, be faster, but it'll be a little more harder to, to comprehend, and that's why we we often do use arrays, even though C uh, basically immediately converts them to pointers internally. Okay, um, you can also have you can have pointers to arrays, uh, you can have pointers to various variables. You can have pointers even to functions, but I'm not going to talk about pointers to functions right now. Uh, when you want to pass an array to a function, the array name itself can be used as an argument to the function without the subscript. So here, here we have uh, uh, average equals number and and arr which is the array name. And uh, so you don't have to put the subscript on it here. here. Here it's defined as having 50 elements, 0 through 49. You're not specifying an element here. You're just passing the array name. And so it's treated as a pointer. If you actually pass it as a uh, array sub 1, then it would be treated as an actual value and you would just pass the value and not the pointer. Global versus external. So global variables are accessible only to the batch program, whereas external variables can be referenced from any batch program residing in the same system or library. So basically, if you have functions that you want to add to all your programs and you put them in a library, then you have to use uh, then you have to use the external designation to pass variables uh, to to have common variables between these modules. If you if if you do if you're using a global, a global variable is just uh, defined outside of a function. So, for instance, a global variable 
you just define it outside the main function and then it is visible to all the functions within the same file. There are a bunch of details about these things. Uh, you can declare them a lot of times, but you can only define them once, basically. Okay, uh, I don't think, uh, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but a variable de declared inside a function is called an internal variable. A variable defined outside of the function is called an external or a global. An external variable is available to many functions. External variables provide an alternative to function arguments and return values for communicating between functions. You can also, if you need, if you want to communicate between functions in other ways, you can also use pointers. Uh, any function may access an external variable by referring to it uh, by name if the name has been declared. The use of static with a local variable inside a block or a function causes it to maintain its value between calls to that block or function. Scope rules. The functions and external variables that make up a C program can be completely separate. The source text of a program may be kept in several files. The scope of a name is the part of the program within which the name can be used. So if, if a name is within scope, it means you can use it. If it's out of scope, it means the function won't recognize that name. And, and for a variable declared at the beginning of a function, the scope is the entire function within which it's declared. And so a local or an internal variable of the same name in different functions are completely unrelated. So you can have five functions. All of them can use uh, the integer i for a for loop. And as long as they're only defined within those functions and not anywhere, not, not globally, those, those, those i's will all be different. Oh, let's see. I, I, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to the end here. Uh, type casting. So you can force variables to a different type. Uh, this, say, variable here may already been cast as an integer, but you can now put in a double and force it to a double for purposes in a calculation, say. Um, all right, I'm going to, I want to jump down. Uh, structures. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on structures. Uh, th they are used extensively uh, in, in the, and I think what I'll do is I'll come back and talk about structures another time and cover them in a little more detail. Um, but but uh, structures can structures are, are basically a type, and in this case the type is personal, and then here's what makes up that type, and then you can refer to this as as PTR one. And so we'll go back and we'll, we'll, we'll explain this. All right, uh, inline assembly. You can always put assembly instructions in line. The syntax for doing that depends on the compiler, so you have to look it up and know. It's usually something like this. Uh, and we saw, we saw one example of this for the no-op in uh, our first lab. Uh, style. So. Uh, I think I may come back and do. I think I, I may just come back and and, and cover uh, cover declarations, um, the inline assembly stuff, and some some of the style uh, considerations later. Uh, you should always put in enough information so you know what the what your program's doing, what inputs it needs, uh, when it was created, who who created it, uh, its name, uh, where it needs to be built, and some other stuff. And, uh, and then when you create arrays, it's always better, like if you wanted to create uh, values to generate one cycle of a sine wave, here, here they go, what you really want is you want to line these things up like this so you can rapidly detect uh, a missing value or a problem. And here, I, I can count this up real fast. I know there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I know that's 60. I can see that immediately. And I know, I know that they're all designated as, as, uh, as hex values, and they all have uh, two bytes. So they're chars. No, they're, uh, they're two bytes. Well, they are chars. Yeah, no, sorry. They're one byte. They're two hex digits, and they are chars. Exactly. So lining these things up makes a big difference. Here, you've done the same thing, but you, you can't just glance at it and see it's cool. 
And if you somehow got in here and typed a, typed a, a random character and messed this up, you wouldn't know it in this format, but this format you could see it immediately. So this vertical alignment is really important when you define uh, arrays or sections of code that can be lined up. So we'll come back and talk about some other style features later. All right, I think with that I'm going to quit. Like I say, I'll do a little video for the lab on Friday, I think, or Thursday, and I think uh, the lab this week will be, uh, we'll do A to D converter. Uh, I wish everybody had a potentiometer so you could vary it continuously, but uh, and if you have one, you can set that up. But I'll basically show you how to just use a little piece of jumper wire. Any, any small wire will work. If you have a DuPont wire that's male to male, that'd be better. Uh, and uh, if you want to come by, we'll, we've got some. We can probably let you have one. Uh, but uh, we'll, the only two values you'll be able to see will be the, the, what ground comes out as and what VCC comes out as. All right, with that, we'll quit.